Samsung has unveiled the Galaxy Pro with a 2.8-inch landscape touchscreen display and a full QWERTY thumb keyboard below it. It runs Android plus TouchWiz, has an 800MHz processor, Samsung's social hub, and is a mid-range phone, spec-wise, with a 3-megapixel camera. Unlike the Pulse Mini later in the show, Nokia's X1-00 candy bar isn't a smartphone, but it is cheap. In fact, it's claimed to be one of the cheapest phones that the company has ever offered. There's a huge loudspeaker mounted on the back that promises 105 FON of perceived loudness, and there's a powerful LED flashlight plus FM radio and five separate contact lists. Good for sharing the phone amongst multiple family members in developing markets. Plus, dedicated music controls, decent looks, micro SD expansion, and a battery life of a week of normal use, and it looks rugged, all for about 30 euros. <laughs> Never mind developing markets, I want one. Windows Phone 7 phones are now finally getting their first real update from Microsoft. The rollout has begun across the world, but for SIM-free handsets only. Also note that this, quote, Nodo update mainly just adds in copy and paste. There's still no attempt to fix multitasking. That's one for later in the year, obviously. Nokia has launched, albeit in beta, a dramatically better version of its core social networking app for its Symbian 3 phones. This one works very well as both a Twitter and Facebook client and is extensible to other networks, and version 1.3.189 is a must-upgrade. While other TV shows like to be aspirational and look at stuff you can't possibly afford, uh, naming no names, but I'm looking at you, a gadget show, or a mountain bike, £2,500, best price. <laughs> the phone show likes to be grounded in reality, and I regularly feature phones that don't cost the earth, either as second-hand eBay items or as bargain basement deals. Firmly, squarely, astoundingly in the latter category is this, the T-Mobile Pulse Mini, an Android 2.1 smartphone available in black or, or pink here. Yes, my daughter helped me pick this one out. Have a guess at the price, though. All in. I mean, with no contract, no commitment. Have a guess how much this Android smartphone costs. £150, I hear someone say. No, no. £100, I hear someone else say more confidently. No, lower, lower, a lot lower. £50, I hear you saying, with uh, hope in your voice. Lower. <laughs> Unbelievably, this smartphone is now just £30 on pay-as-you-go in the UK, mixing in with the usual cheap and nasty feature tat phones, and in fact being quite a bit cheaper than most of them. Of course, the, the Pulse Mini itself is a little bit cheap and nasty, and certainly the lowest-end Android smartphone I've ever tried. But at this price, you could... You could buy 15 of these for one iPhone 4 or, or 10 of these for one Nokia N8. And yet this still has all your favourite Android apps, all your Google data, real-time sat-nav bar, Google Maps 5, you know, voice directions. Yes, it's got GPS as well. Fast data via Wi-Fi. Yes, that's in here as well. Uh, a three megapixel autofocus camera that's not the worst I've ever seen with an LED flash. And all of this for £30. That's staggering. Nokia's low-end Symbian resistive touchscreen phones managed to edge down into the low end of the phone market with devices like the 5230 last year for between £50 and £100, but this is a whole new ballgame. Arguably a better device too, certainly in terms of currency of OS and specifications, and looking at specs, there's, there's almost nothing that this Pulse Mini hasn't got. I say almost. Although this ticks all the right bullet points, there is evidence at most turns, this is at heart a budget model. The screen's only quarter VGA and only 2.8 inches, which is okay for many phone uses, and bearing in mind the overall form factor, which is pretty darn tiny, really. Great form factor for a, just a general purpose phone. What's not quite so acceptable is the understandable, given the price, use of a resistive touchscreen. So no multi-touch, and you also have to really retrain your brain to press in when swiping and tapping. Secondly, despite having a 600 megahertz processor, in theory, in practice it's underclocked to 528 megahertz, and the GPU, which is also supposed to be, is absent without leave. As a result, the Pulse Mini is often slow to complete day-to-day -day tasks, whether it's downloading and installing an app or checking your Gmail. RAM is another culprit, with only 16 megabyte free after booting, a real showstopper for anyone who does actually want to do more with Android. There's enough flash memory for casual users, by the way. Plus, you get a two gigabyte micro SD card here in the box and in the device, and you can obviously stick a lot more in for your music collection. 
I say music rather than a video because the Pulse Mini is limited to vanilla MP4 codecs. There's no WMV support, no H.264. Though Google's YouTube application does work surprisingly well on this, and nice and fluid. What did surprise me was the stills camera and the speaker. The camera is odd in that it auto-focuses as you line your shot up, so that in theory, one press on the dedicated shutter key here, yes, it's got one of those too, and you take your photo instantly. You can hear and feel the autofocus mechanism moving the lens around, and there's something of a knack to lining up a shot and uh, forcing a new autofocus cycle. Sadly, there's a bit of shutter lag here. You have to hold still after pressing the shutter for a good second. Uh, plus, sunlight shots are subject to quite a bit of oversaturation, though in fairness, I've seen both these faults in HTC smartphones costing 10 times more. Talking of HTC and their legendarily poor phone speakers, the Pulse Mini's speaker here knocks spots off all the HTC top-end smartphones I've tried. Listen to the quality here. It's not terrifically loud, but there's some decent quality there. There's a bit of bass. For such a small, low-end smartphone, that's pretty darn good. There's a stylus, this has got a resistive touchscreen after all, an 1150 milliamp hour lithium ion battery, dedicated send and end keys, there's micro USB data here and charging, and a 3.5 mil audio jack to complete the hardware. The software is pretty standard Android, except that you get nine home screens, <laughs> a bit over the top given the limited RAM. There's a file manager utility, a notepad utility, a servo local search, and a demo of Telenav. Look, this is a solid little Android 2.1 smartphone, let down really only by performance and by the resistive touchscreen. But come on, it's £30 all in. You could pay more than that taking your partner out to the local cafe for lunch. And yet it's a full, connected, position-aware, modernish Android 2.1 smartphone. And it comes with six months free unlimited internet. And that's worth another £20. <laughs> it's hardly almost giving it away. And it's cheaper than a standalone sat nav, cheaper than a standalone touchscreen music player, cheaper than many standalone cameras, all of which it can largely replace. I previously said the orange San Francisco at £99 was the bargain of 2010. I think in the Pulse Mini I found the bargain of 2011 already. One common theme among all my reviews of Motorola smartphones, here's the Defy, in recent days has been how much I hate Moto Blur. OK, it was, it was passable on the flip out, but then that's aimed at the smartphone newbies. On the Defy and the Milestone 2, for example, it just gets in the way, big time. Unfortunately, Motorola hasn't provided a way to turn Moto Blur off, so I started investigating. I did look into routing this Defy, which turned out to be a doddle once I'd installed Z4 Root, which you can find via Google, shown here. The next step was to look into ways to flash a custom blurless firmware. Such things do exist for the Defy and other Motorola phones, but it's far harder to flash one of these than an open phone like the uh, Google Nexus One here. After three hours of reading through documentation and experimenting, I hit a brick wall and the limit of my expertise. It seems like you have to be a Linux guru to really get going with firmware modding on Motorola's. However, thanks to a tip-off from viewer Jamie Holland, thanks Jamie, it turns out there's a trick to bypass Moto Blur, a workaround. Stepping through the setup process, when you get to the Moto Blur setup screen and are faced with two choices, don't choose either. Don't choose either. Instead, press the menu icon and you'll see a little known skip setup option. Eureka! You then have to acknowledge a nanny state warning screen about not being able to use Motorola's fabulous blur screens, yada yada. And then you're back to the main Android home screen. Right, we're off and running. Step two is presumably to drag the blur widgets you don't want, so that's basically all of them, down to the trash can, but you're still then left with the horrible home screen navigation pop-ups. The solution here is to go into the Android market and install a third-party utility like Launcher Pro here. This completely replaces the Motorola one, and there's not only no sign of Moto Blur, there are extra optimizations and features that Motorola and even Google hadn't even thought of. Smooth, isn't it? In this app drawer, by the way, you can actually remove icons for applications you don't use very often. Very, very clever. Caveats? Well, there are occasional reminders of Moto Blur's existence and various dialogues, but you can just ignore these. One further annoyance is that the over-the-air firmware updates here are hardwired to go through Moto Blur. But I guess if you knew Android 2.2 was out due for quarter two for this Defy, 
you could just quickly set up a Motorblur account, update the OS, and then zap the account again. Uh, I guess you might need to hard reset, skip blur again, and then resync your apps and data. Fun, 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 though, for geeks like me, and it provides a way to have Motorola build and component quality, no more shoddy HTC here, while staying with Android and avoiding Moto Blur. It's a win, win, win. Job done. For now. Now, one thing that may have put you off buying a Nokia N8, for example, is the fact that the battery is not, in theory, user replaceable. But with a Torx T4 screwdriver here, bought for a couple of quid off eBay, you simply undo each of the bottom screws around six revolutions. Don't undo them completely because they're very small and they fall out and you will lose them. You then slide the end cap off and unclip the plastic clip, as shown here. You then pull the tab and there goes the battery. And of course you've got a charged spare battery complete with its own little sticker. You can improvise the sticker if you need to. Slide it back in, insert the clip, clip it on place, and then re-insert the back cover. This is probably the fiddliest bit, just lining it up and making sure it goes on square. And the, the screws, of course, will be fully in already. You just need to tighten them back up the six revolutions and you're done. On the left, on the right, and that's it. The battery change on N8 in around about 50 seconds is my best time. So that's not too bad at all.